I, I heard that, Gary. Um, real fast, I just want to say it's a great day. I thought the day went really well. Uh, anytime you get to spend time with the senators and it's a, a jovial environment like that, I think it's a great way to kick it off. I thought the governor's speech was excellent. I thought that, uh, as always, you know, there was far more that we agree with than, than what we disagree with. And I think it's uh, um, a kickoff to what I hope to be a, uh, a great 60 days that's very productive and transformative for the people of the state of Florida. Do you want to say a few words, Chairman? No, Speaker, I just uh, I, I want to echo some of that. I think what, what you heard a lot of there uh, is a lot of the same ambitions that we have for the state of Florida. There's some very minor disagreements on, on how we achieve some of that. But for the most part, lowering the burden of, on, of tax on the business owners of Florida and homeowners of Florida is a priority for all of us. And choice in education is a priority for all of us. So it was a good day. With that, we'll take any questions. Well, what do you think about the fact that you basically, in, in a room full of all of you, said, you don't know what it's like to be poor. You don't know what it's like to be hungry. You don't know what it's like to, to, to worry about foreclosure. And that's why I'm fighting the way I am for Enterprise Florida to support. Well, what, what I would say is that, uh, that I, I'm not alone when I say very many of us in that chamber know what it's like to be poor. We know what it's like uh, to have a car repossessed, to have the power cut uh, in your house. We also know a lot uh, about what it's like to start a business and to see the barriers of business in front of you and trying to get over those. And honestly, I can't understand for the life of me why, while I was building my business, I would have liked some of my tax dollars to go to a possible competitor. Imagine if the governor, while he had that famed donut shop that he started, imagine if his tax dollars from that donut shop would have gone to Dunkin' Donuts so that they could come across the street and compete against him. How difficult would that have been for that company? As far as moving from state to state, we talked about it yesterday in committee. States first make a decision of what are the candidates of the states they'd like to be in. Then they, select, then they get, bring in site selectors, and those site selectors start to negotiate a deal. It's a proverbial tail wagging the dog, and we have to get away from it. States like Georgia and some other states have decided for whatever reason that they want to use their taxpayer dollars for that. But as the governor pointed out, we've increased by 225,000 jobs in the last year. There was no EFI money last year. If you all remembered, it was zeroed out. And as far as moving companies, Oliva Cigar Company started in Georgia. I moved to, to Florida because I love Florida. I've lived here my whole life. I didn't need an incentive to do that. I just needed the right conditions. We've got to work hard with the governor to reduce the commercial lease tax. We've got to work hard to reduce the corporate income tax. Those types of things will bring companies here. All we know is the statement that we received, and we've said it, you know, when there's been these change in, changes at different agencies, whether it's DEP or whatever, we've always been very clear that our job is to be policymakers. We don't get into the personnel decisions that occur in another branch of government, um, but, and we have not had any conversations with him about why he made that decision. I think what we were talking about was optimistic. I think what we were saying is that what makes our country different, what separates us from all other countries of the world is when you can have, anybody can have, from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich, have that right to engage in spirited intellectual debate. Hopefully it's civil, hopefully it's always civil. But when you have that right, that's when the democracy is working. That's when we can feel reassured that good things are gonna happen. That's the opposite. The opposite is when you have calm ships and everyone's just you know, walking in uh, step in step and line in line, in line and, and we're not really fighting for 
big bills. We're rubber stamping bills. We're not engaged in debate. That's when people should be worried. Um, and so I, what we're saying is, look, and the perfect example is, you guys did write. You guys did write extensively that this whole place between the Senate and the House, they have these rules on the budget, they have these rules on the budget, look out, it's World War III, nothing's going to get done, it's going to go on forever. And here we are kicking off session with the most transformative, the most um, open, um, the most uh, accountable budget, joint budget rules of any state in the union. Done together. Yes, they're, they're, yes, when you get together with two competing forces, but you're civil and you have the intellectual debate. Yeah, there's passion. Yeah, there's going back and forth. And sometimes there's quotes that we would all want to take back. But at the end of the day, if you're sitting there and you really have the well-being of the state and trying to create a transformative change for their benefit, Good things happen. And so now, yes, despite all the writings, despite all the articles and all the TV shows, guess what we have? We have the best budget joint rules of any state in the union. Speaking That's great. Question about, about taxes, sir. And that is this. Um, you talked about uh, raising the homestead exemption another, you know, level to seventy five thousand dollars and a savings of seven hundred million in property taxes for the Marines. You're obviously going to contrast that with the governor whose education budget would raise property taxes on the Marines. That's over um, 700 million. First of all, I think it's like it's like 730, Steve. I'm not sure the exact number, but no, I think what all of these things you don't. I mean, obviously, we all write budgets. The Senate writes a budget. The House writes a budget. The governor gives his proposal, and so you can immediately see big differences between the three. And yeah, and so I mean, I think what we've talked about, and which we, we talked about today in the opening day, is we're committed to not raising property taxes, and and, and there's no question about it. I thought former President Gates wrote a great op-ed that discussed why allowing the RLE to go unchecked um, is a property tax increase. In fact, the irony is, is that we put in statute for local governments that if you do not go back to the rollback rate, for these are for counties, not just for school boards, if you don't go back to the rollback, rollback rate, you have to notice it. We forced them. The state wrote this in our statutes. We said, then you guys better notice it as a tax increase. And yet we're not going to do the same thing. No, that's, that would be hypocrisy. So obviously we're going to fight for that. Um, we're also going to fight for, um, I think, the greatest expenditure out of the House that we will engage in, and that's why I talked about it, is it's going to be very expensive, Steve, to try to figure out a way to end failure factories. But the, the concept that we still have them, the concept that we have kids stuck for five years, some of them, tens of thousands for five years in a failure factory where you're just robbing them of that dignity and that future, that's got to change and that's going to be very expensive to do. So we're going to, I, don't, I think the governor put a bunch of uh, money into public education. We're going to put a bunch of money into public education. I think at the end of the day, the argument is going to be how do we spend it? Mr. Speaker, uh, first, thank you for fixing my microphone. Appreciate yeah. that. Um, but kind of building up what um, Steve was asking about, is there a way in which including that additional homestead exemption would allow the RLE the same as the governor is asking for, or do you still want to see that? We're, we're doing both. Okay. But, but, Mr. Speaker, is there enough room to do Governor Scott's tax cut of mainly commercial leases that you said you just want to do this property tax cut? And, you know, Senator Negron, we haven't talked about really yet, as much wants to do some things that are going to cost some money. I mean, it just back to the napkin math, indicates that somebody's office is going to get bored here. What, what, how do you see this all ending? And can we get on done on time? Uh, yeah, I think we can absolutely get done on time. And I think everyone, you know, again, these are conversations that have taken place in quotes. Um, Senator Negron, President Negron, um, said that why are there somehow sacred cows, sorry, I did again, <laughs> sacred cow in the budgets. Um, that somehow have been in there for you know decades and nobody's gone back and looked at them and said, hey, are they really having the return on investment? Are they really efficacious in what they were promised to do? And, and those things are all on the chopping block. You know, there's 400, as we talked, just with these reforms, there's 400 million plus dollars of recurring member projects, give or take, in the budget. If you just cut 25% of it, that's $100 million. And I got news for you, that $100 million going to some of the things that Senator Negron or, or Governor Scott or the House are talking about, um, is far, far more transformational. And so, yes, there's going to be those things that are going to get cut, and that's okay, too, because we really have not had that, um, apart from the Great Recession, we had to make some difficult choices. We need to go back in there and look at these historical things and decide whether or not um, they really have value for the taxpayer and, and fix them. And we knew that 
that position was untenable in the Senate, now you guys have backed away to an extent from those rules to compromise. So I guess my question is, if the message you're giving us today is that you know you all say things and say we're hard and fast on this position, such as eliminating Enterprise Florida, which we know is untenable with the governor, but you're willing to eventually back away from that. I think that we've spoken exhaustively about the concept of good compromise and bad compromise. And so yes, if you're asking us, did we sit down and have a decision that said, and the leadership of the House, wait a second, here's, what we're, here's where we're at. We have the strongest set of rules of any chamber and any legislature in any state in the union. The Senate now is willing to jointly have the strongest joint rules of any legislature in the union, but it means we got to come off a little bit of what we did. Does that sound like a good idea or a bad idea? That's good compromise for not, to not work that out and, and to and to take that joint rule. That I don't know. I mean, Speaker D. Oliva's here. Uh, you can go talk to President Designate Galvano. Those rules are likely to stay there for an awfully long time. He gave a very passionate speech on the floor on why these were so transformative. So yes, that's good compromise. Why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't anyone do that? But but there are, yeah. I'll tell you a bad a bad compromise is a tax increase. So I guess I can tell you right now, we will not yield on the RLE. We're not raising people's property taxes. We've said it a lot. We're not doing it. That's a that's a bad compromise, and it violates everything we've said. Find me. Let me finish. Find Tia. Find me. Man, you should push you today. Um, I'm just kidding. Tia, find me. Find me. I want you to travel the state. Find the senator, find the house member, find the governor, find the cabinet member, find me the person who went out there and knocked on doors and said, hey, my name is John Doe. I'm running for state representative and I want you to know that there's a good chance I'll be raising your property taxes. Find me that mail piece. It doesn't exist. So all we want to do is govern the way we campaigned. That's not a bad thing. I just, I feel like you, I just want to just ask, make sure I understand, is coming away from something that I think that we feel very, well, you know what, well, all, on all these issues, we know more. Every day we know more. Um, every day we figure out ways um, to get to that end goal. You know, so uh, yesterday in, in, in Chairman Oliva's committee, you know, two bills were split out, some changes were made, and now you see, you know, the, the numbers in opposition dwindle every day. So if, if those bills come off the floor, they go to the Senate, and then the negotiation starts to take place. But we feel, we, we absolutely have two government agencies. Let's, honestly, this whole concept of public-private is a ruse. There's nothing private about Enterprise Florida. And you heard it in committee yesterday. There's nothing private, for the most part, about Visit Florida. They're basically, almost, entirely, 100% funded with taxpayer dollars. So let's, now we have these government agencies. And on top of that, because they call themselves public-private, they go out there and they hide in the darkness and they say that we, don't, we can't shine a light on all these contracts and all these deals and all that kind of stuff. And we've just said, no, you're public. Let's call it what it is. We'll shine everything on you. We want every contract, every deal, how you're spending taxpayer money. And, and the reality is that on top of that, we have DEO, which is a government agency that is engaged. So how many government agencies do we need I think our position is pretty valid. I think it's winnable with the, with the electorate. We don't need two government agencies doing, in essence, the same thing. We ought to have one. It ought to be public. It ought to have all the requirements of open and, openness and transparency for the taxpayers who are p funding it. Um, and that's our position. I think, I think we, we feel good about you, getting do you, there. Do you think Representative Bruder's bill is going to get a hearing, or what are your thoughts on that? The economic development folks seem to like that one. Yeah, I, I haven't seen um, Representative Gruder's bill. I haven't read it. I've heard about it. That was mentioned yesterday in, in Chairman Oliva's committee. Um, I think that, as, as you have seen, and you'll see on Thursday and Friday, the House, the entire body, Democrats and Republicans, will have, come Friday, a position on what we should do with those entities, and I think those will be our position. So there's no sense having another position. I have, I've also uh, not read the bill. But, but I, I, I do think, again, the, 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 the interesting part of the argument, and, and one we have to pay attention to, the same with Enterprise's visit. Enterprise Florida does not hold a monopoly on job creation in Florida. Not only does it not hold a monopoly, even by its own numbers, it is a fraction of a percent. Visit Florida does not hold a monopoly on tourism in Florida. And whatever effects they have, they're somewhat unquantifiable. And one of the things that even this conversation has brought out 
is that both of those organizations needed a tremendous amount of work. Yet two years ago, everyone was singing their praises. Before last year's zeroing them out, these were two of the darlings of Florida. All of this was going on. All of it. No one was talking about it. No one felt like it needed reform. Now we have people talking about how it needs reform. The same thing with the rules. The rules go from one year to the other and they never change. No one would have talked about binding our own hands, limiting ourselves to non-recurring funds for new projects. That's going to have billions and billions of dollars of an effect. Conversation would have never been had. There are conversations being had here that have never been had before. This is transformational. Yeah, does it rock some boats? It's going to rock some boats. Absolutely. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what Senator Dallas said. I'm paraphrasing what Senator Dallas said. One more. This is the last question. I'm paraphrasing what Senator Dallas said on the floor. My close colleagues in the Senate can correct me. I heard him say, we're basically just going back to the way it was in 2008 or 2009. The project's got to be on one side or the other before we get to conference. Contrary to transformational, this is going back to the good old days, Senator Dallas said. I'd like your response to that. I don't know. Ask me Monday. Let me let me send over a copy to Senator Lat Valley, give him a chance to read them and then and then I'll uh, and then I'll see where his position is. <laughs> That's it, we're good. I appreciate it. Uh nope.